Welcome to Perceptions Today podcast where we discuss consciousness in all forms. December 2021, episode 1, Anthony Peake's Roundtable with the Public, part 1 of 7. He is a writer who deals with the borderline areas of human consciousness. John's question about the daemon, which I thought was a really interesting one to start with. Um, just very quickly, just so that um, probably anybody coming in now who didn't hear John's question. John, can you just give the question again and I'll answer it again. I just think it's just for listeners coming in later. So if you could just mention your question again and then I'll answer it. Yeah, yeah no, no problem, sir. I don't mind at all. Uh, basically, I'm, I'm just trying to, to um, combine the, the two different information sets, one being the surgical um, uh, severing of the corpus callosum and the two different personalities emerging versus the personality that I feel that I am, and then my personal experience with this concept of the daemon, which also appears to be a separate personality structure. And so does that mean that there are three of us or four of us, or how does that, or is it that the alternate personality that, is, that showed up in the corpus callosum experiment was the daemon? Is, that, is the daemon living in the other hemisphere, or is, is there some other model that, that, I, that can help me understand this relationship? This is an instance of the conversation coming up in the roundtable discussion. Participants knew it was being recorded. Welcome to Perceptions Today. It's the 18th of October, 2021. Today, our esteemed guest is Anthony Peake for a meet and greet. Perceptions Today actually deals in consciousness research in all areas, along with pain management. I'm your host, Paul. Your co-host is Central Awareness dealing in meditation coaching and energy work, known as Melissa. Here I've removed the instructions on how to use the Twitter spaces. Sometimes we had technical difficulties and you will actually hear me removing pauses from here and also the laughter that it created as we had technical issues or people just not being able to respond in time. His books deal with consciousness in all forms backing up all his research with actual publications as you will see in many of his books it's very difficult to actually pull holes in his work along with the 10 actual books he's published he's got a book sales total of a hundred thousand worldwide in mo most international language and he's spoken around the world being a guest on numerous podcasts and it's my great pleasure to welcome anthony peak please take the floor and introduce yourself Hello, everybody. As a wonderful introduction there from Paul. Yeah, um, I'm based in the UK, uh, originally from Merseyside in the northwest of England. Um, I was educated at uh, Warwick University, and then I did postgraduate at the London School of Economics. Um, I've had a career as a, a management and business consultant, but around about 20, 21 years ago, 22 years ago, I decided to take a year out to write a book didn't know what I was going to be writing about, but I just had this overwhelming urge to write. I had done ever since childhood, really. And indeed, since um, probably uh, the mid-1960s, I've been fascinated by altered states of consciousness, um, near-death experiences, out-of-the-body experiences, UFO encounters, you name it. These were the things I was fascinated by. And I was fortunate enough that when I went to university, I was allowed to study uh, the sociology of religion, sociology of language, and sociology of belief. So I had the opportunity there for having an academic grounding in uh, my subject matter. Um, funnily enough, by background, I'm a frustrated art historian in that I was going to be doing my PhD in an Italian artist called Piero della Francesca, but that never came to fruition because I was told at the time, we don't need art historians, we need people in business. So my grant went to my postgraduate course at the London School of Economics. Um, written now, um, fortunately, um, a number of publishers are interested in publishing my work over the years. Uh, just to stress, I am not vanity published. My publishers pay me um, to, to, uh, for my work. So, you know, there is a subtle difference between the kind of work I write and a number of other writers in this field. Um, my books now, I've written 12 and I'm working on my 13th book at the moment. I uh, just finished my 13th book at the moment, which will be out in June of next year. Um, my first book is The Life After Death, the Extraordinary Science of What Happens When We Die, has been translated into most European languages and I think sold around about 55,000 copies worldwide. Uh, you'll also find my work um, in Kindle, 
Uh, it is also um, also three of my books I've actually recorded on Audible. My three first books are out on Audible with me reading them. And my late, latest book, The Hidden Universe, is also out on Audible with a, an actor reading it. Um, in general, my work is scientifically based. I start with the science and then from the science move into speculation. But it's always just based on science. If the science doesn't work, I back off from it. Um, I don't do um, crazy speculations. I do science because I think that's the only way forward in terms of understanding these phenomena. But at the same token, um, I am quite a skeptic in many ways as well. Um, uh, but if somebody comes along with ideas that can convince me, either through academic research or whatever, that these things are correct or indeed that some of my work is incorrect, that's fine. I don't mind. I'm not a guru. I'm not anybody, anybody special. I'm just an ordinary guy. So that's me. And if you'd like to introduce yourself, Melissa. Thank you. Um, most of you in this room might know me. Um, my name is Melissa. A little bit about myself. So my dream was always to have a business helping other people. Um, the way that became about was uh, growing up, I was always quite sensitive to energies. Um, being an empath as well, I would take on other people's emotions as well. Like I could feel when they were sad um and also felt that this world didn't feel right so that led to me having anxiety attacks and not knowing how to handle them it led to depression so then I went to a doctor and again most of you will know this I've shared this with a lot of you I went to a doctor she recommended therapy and antidepressants and I said no to both of those because um I didn't, I, I didn't want my parents to find out that I was going to see a therapist and not that there's anything wrong with that. I think that's a great thing. But I did also didn't want to go on to antidepressants because of the I've seen family and friends try to come off them and I've seen them have the withdrawal symptoms. I was, I've also seen the side effects of antidepressants. So I thought, no, I'm going to do this on my own. So I've tried yoga, i tried Tai Chi, and the only thing that really helped with me was meditation. Um, that was the only thing that really got to the core issue and helped heal um, my anxiety attacks. So I no longer have these massive panic attacks, which is awesome. Um, and the, I loved the inner peace that I would feel when I was meditating. So the more I meditated, that eventually helped my intuition to grow stronger as well. Um, and it also helped, you know, my senses to energy become even more sensitive um, and then I got into studying psychosomatics to complement my energy work. Um, and psychosomatics, that focuses on how our thoughts and how our emotions shape our body. So I wanted to help coach people on meditation and how they can also overcome anxiety attacks and um, severe panic attacks the same way meditation helped me. And also how, you know, their thoughts and the emotions that they're not dealing with and suppressing how that shapes their body. Um, so I do that through psychosomatics. And then, yeah, and so basically just started my own business and I decided to call it Centered Awareness. Now, we're going to go in the order that I can see on the screen. If John Hudson has a question or would like to introduce himself, as I said, if you can remember the format that is the best way to introduce, that would be great. Take this floor. Hello. Uh, yes, um, I'm uh, uh, Desmoden uh, or John Hudson on Twitter. Uh, my name is John Hudson. It, it's a pleasure to speak to you, sir. Um, uh, basically, my knowledge of you come from the book The Daemon, as well as uh, Is There Life After Death, which uh, both had tremendous impact on me. And I want to especially thank you because you gave me finally a name for the person or whatever is uh, been helping me throughout life. So I do appreciate it. Uh, if I can go on to my question, um, basically what I'm struggling with in my own research is uh, basically, you know, trying to um, correlate or, or somehow merge this information that, that I essentially learned from one of your books about, about the um, experiments that were done um, where the corpus callosum was severed and two different personalities emerged, making it appear as if there is, you know, two different states or two different um, consciousnesses in the brain. And what I'm having trouble with is, is how to merge this with this idea of a daemon or um, a superconscious or, or a subconscious that is itself another um, 
uh, you know, thought process or consciousness that has more information than I do and, and controls or, or, or leaks information to me at certain times. And I have very strong personal evidence of this. So I'm, I'm a firm believer in this daemon concept. But what I'm having trouble with is, is merging it with this concept of different um, personality states in the different hemispheres. And so where does the daemon sit? Where do I sit? Is the other personality that, that arose in those experiments the daemon, or is the daemon a third party? I'm just I'm having trouble, and the reason why I think it's, it's it you might know is because I learned about both of these concepts in your books, and so I'm hoping that you might have some way of of combining that information into a model that makes sense. Do you want me to answer that question now, Paul, or shall I shall I wait until everybody else has gone through? Again, that's a good one. Um, are you quite happy, John Hudson, to just um, tell us where you pick up most of his social media from as well? And we didn't really catch where you came from in the world. Are you happy to have your actual question slightly delayed until we got a few more people in? I have absolutely no problem with it being delayed, although it was a rather verbose question. So I, I hope that um, it can be remembered depending on how long it takes. Um, and then um, I, I do follow him on Twitter, um, but um, most of most of my knowledge of him uh, comes from from those two books. And, and you know, I, there's others I plan to read, but um, those two books are, are are actually have been quite important to my own research. And uh, I am uh, calling in from uh, California, from the Bay Area. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Very much. What we can what we can do on that is I've made a note of your question, John, and I think it's an excellent question. Um, and we'll we'll come back to that. So effectively, when we start, I'll focus in on that one first. And the longest we're starting. Sorry, Sounds the longest we wait for that is probably about ten minutes. You obviously have more than ten minutes available to yourself. Yes. Oh, John. me absolutely. No, no. Okay, that's good. I don't about, want to worry about Anthony. Yeah, no, no, string no, you out on these things. No, no, what no, we... absolutely not. What also Anthony is on Instagram on YouTube channel with his account quite easily found by typing in his name and Facebook. I think uh, just to stress, it's Facebook that's my major um, announcement announcement point to the world. Generally, it's Facebook. You just look up Anthony Peak and you'll find me there for conversations and yes. obviously for just looking up for the videos of people and guests he's done is worthwhile on YouTube itself. Those are the main kind Absolutely. of errors that I would say. Greybeard, would you like to come and take the floor? Hi, good morning, everyone. Good morning, Anthony Peake. Um, my name's uh, well, on Twitter is Greybeard. Uh, you can call me Toby. I'm from uh, the United States as well as John, except I'm on the other side. I'm over by the uh, Great Lakes in uh, New York State. Um, I'm fairly new to you and your writing. Um, I have not, admittedly, have to <laughs> say I have not seen your books yet. Um, but I've watched several videos and interviews of you, and uh, Paul has introduced me to you. So you're fairly new, um, but I do follow you on Twitter. Uh, that's about it so far. And then uh, my question to you would be, uh, in your research with the temporal lobe epilepsy, uh, did you find that your patients, um, you know, with their communication with the daemon, um, if it was suppressed with medications such as um, Tegretol or other ones that they use, and what did you see with that? Okay, Greybeard, that's our Toby, that's noted, and we'll come back to that one as well. Okay, that's wonderful. Again, a fascinating question. I think also, Anthony, if you also feed in with Myron Dahl because of the way that his Charon was actually suppressed with medication as well, that would be a fantastic one to incorporate in the answer. That, that is exactly it. I will focus in on Myron Dial's experiences and explain a little bit about Myron Dial and the way in which I've written about him in, I think, about at least four books. Uh, and intriguingly enough, uh, I swapped messages with him today, uh, and we're going to have him on as, on a, as a full two-hour, two hour, two-and-a-half-hour guest on my InCon uh, Monday afternoon um, podcast uh, in a couple of weeks' time. So that's going to be very interesting, and you guys really need to check this out because this guy is quite extraordinary. I can add to that because I was managed to get a ticket for Hidden Truths when he was giving his presentation of the five-year film that was put together, which is a documentary. You can find this on Facebook and type in the word Charon, C-H-A-R-O-N. It will give you a link to the, the film, which is only about four to five minutes, 
But then again, if you link back to Myron Dahl's Facebook page, go through his Twitter feed, um, through his feed on Facebook, you'll find his YouTube video where he's got the question and answer sessions with the Epilepsy Trust called Hidden Truths. And there's multiple people that come through and give questions and answers. And it was just amazing to be there and have the opportunity to get a free ticket for that one. Renegade, would you like to take the floor? Well, uh, I want to start with saying uh, good morning to all. And uh, thank you, Anthony, for a short, in short introduction for, uh, from yourself. One moment. It's a car disturbing me. So uh, I want to keep it short, this introduction uh, about myself. Um, I started uh, at a very, very early age with uh, investigating paranormal um, yeah, stuff like uh, ghosts, um, anything like that. And it was Arthur C. Clarke who brought me to you. And I've discussed this, discussed this with Paul uh, earlier. Um, yeah, this triggering from the paranormal, yeah, lead me to other things and. It also turned me into a very skeptic person, so I can agree with your scientific uh, approach. And from my own approach, I want to combine uh, creativity, nature, and related stuff into a big soup. So that sounds fascinating. That sounds fascinating. Are you um, are you Scandinavian by origin? No, I'm uh, Dutch. Oh, Dutch, yeah, I thought so. I, I spent time working for KLM um, for many years, and I spent an awful lot of time in Amsterdam, one of my favorite cities. I love Amsterdam. It's, uh, it's got a great place. Well, and by the way, I'm, I'm not uh, perfect in speaking uh, uh, on the platform, but I see this as a huge exercise for myself to uh, express myself in a more uh, different way. Sounds fairly good to me. So. Uh, <laughs> I just have to add into this one about Renegade. Renegade is a really up and coming, great photographer. If you go by his same handle onto Instagram, his wildlife photography, composition and storytelling is just amazing. I come from this from the fact that I dabble in photography and they're stunning images. You will actually look at them for a long period of time instead of actually just wandering past something. So people should recognize this credit for him. Uh, thank you, Paul, for the uh, big compliments. But before I started uh, photography, I was a drawer and painter. And I tried to express my uh, visions into this medium. But then suddenly I realized that it, I was lacked by techniques. And then I skipped to photography. And before I knew I was addicted to it. And uh, yeah, I still like it. But, uh, thanks for the compliment. That's not a problem. So, Renegade, your question's obviously been logged by Anthony at this point. And we're quite happy with going on to RN Voot. Yes, Anthony? I am indeed. Yeah, no, that's good. Excellent. Now, RN Voot is a decent author and researcher friend of mine so this is the way why i'm just stumbling over the bits and pieces so if you'd like to take the floor um he's gone he's gone into listening so i've just sent him an invite to become a speaker again hi can you hear me very faintly how about now is that, is that any better you're still faint are you yeah. using yeah. headphones or speaker no, no, no. I'm, I'm using the free on the telephone and on the mobile phone at the moment. It's not a problem. I'll, I'll mess around with my device. And, uh, no, no, back. no. That's good. That's better than what you had. That is a hell of a lot yeah. better than what you had. Continue, please. <laughs> well, good morning and good evening, everyone, depending on where in the world you are. Thanks for your time as well. And I'm looking forward to our proposed uh, conversation sometime in the future. Um, I originally, well, I'm not sure whether you know, but I originally found your work um, via... Um, um, the Ascension podcast, which introduced me to the first book of yours I actually read, The Infinite Minefield, which I thought directly connected to my own uh, research, which is um, ancient civilizations, their cosmology, and the potential use of antigenic compounds. So my question um, for yourself today, Anthony, would be, 
what role do you believe um, BMT may or may not play with regard to opening the, uh, the door to understanding the, the key to human consciousness? That was a wonderful question, and I, I still recall our meeting before my talk in Brighton a few years ago when we were with the Dreaming Draguers guys. Um, and I think that's an excellent question, and there's so much to get into in that one. Uh, I'm going to really love responding to that one. So thanks, th thanks for that, RN. Thank you. I look to it. Yeah, I, I, you seem to got a pillow over your microphone, so you went a bit soft and muffled. I don't know what goes on with you with technology. It always is entertaining. <laughs> right. I think it's probably the DMTLs or the proverbial glitch in the Matrix, but I'll, uh, I'll try oh, and remedy it. Crystal, from no, 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 stop. Crystal <laughs> clear, <laughs> crystal clear. <laughs> we get through this. Super. We've had the wheels come off our bus quite easily. We can put them back on again. Right, okay. Has Terry got access to speak? No, I'll send him that. I've just sent him a link, so I'll just see if that's going through. And Plow Nation as well. Plow Nation, yeah. Sorry, Plow Nation. I'll send that invite. Terry, can you hear us? If you can't talk, please use the fist symbol, which is located in your icon tray underneath the heart. And Rai, do you have a question? If so, I've given you access to speaking, hopefully. Okay, Terry has speaker access. Excellent. Terry, please take the floor. Oh, hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, my name's Terry. Um, I'm from Liverpool in the UK. Um, I don't have a question at the moment. I'm just sort of uh, listening in, really, at this at this point. Yeah. It's, it's always great to have a fellow Scouser on the, on the group. Welcome, Terry. Have you come into this cold? Do you know who Anthony Peake is, apart from just the introduction? Yeah, no, so uh, I know uh, who Anthony is before uh, yeah, I joined. Uh, that's the reason why I, joined, I saw on Twitter that he was um, he was part of this. So, yeah, I sort of... Excellent. Yeah. Keep you all entertained. Now, Rai, can you hear us? Do you accept the invitation? No, I sent him the invitation as well, but I think he Okay, maybe he doesn't want to. That's fine. That's okay. So we're doing very well at the moment where you've got the 10 people in the room. And if you fancy responding to any of the questions that have been put to you, at this present time, we will continue through. Anthony, sorry, I should have used a word after that. I'm just nodding my head and pointing at icons. This is really quite amazing. Okay, yeah, no, that sounds good to me. Right, so shall I start with um, John, John's question about the daemon, which I thought was a really interesting one to start with. Um, just very quickly, just so that um, probably anybody coming in now who didn't hear John's question. John, can you just give the question again and I'll answer it again. I just think it's just for listeners coming in later. So if you could just mention your question again and then I'll answer it. Yeah, yeah no, no problem, sir. I don't mind at all. Uh, basically, I'm, I'm just trying to, to um, combine the, the two different information sets, one being the surgical um, uh, severing of the corpus callosum and the two different personalities emerging versus the personality that I feel that I am and then my personal experience with this concept of the daemon, which also appears to be a separate personality structure. And so does that mean that there are three of us or four of us or how does that or is it that the alternate personality that, is, that showed up in the corpus callosum experiment was the daemon? Is that is the daemon living in the other hemisphere or is, is there some other model that, that, I, that can help me understand this relationship? Thank you very much for that question, John, because it's one of the things that, um, one of the things I need to explain is that my writing is iterative. Over the years, um, my ideas have, have not necessarily changed, but they've been honed by more information and discussing with, with a wider group of individuals. When I first wrote my book, uh, Is There Life After Death? The Extraordinary Science of What Happens When We Die, that was originally written in uh, 1999 to 2000. And at that time, um, I had a fairly restricted contact list, as it were, because I was comparatively unknown, while well, I was an unknown individual. Um, and over the years, that's broadened out. So I've had the opportunity to talk to neurologists, neurochemists, neurophysiologists, as well over the years. But in the first book, I very much was fascinated by a series of experiments that took place from the 1940s through to the early 1960s 
um, basically done by uh, two guys, uh, Roger Sperry and Michael Gazaniga. And what they did was they, they dealt with individuals that had intractable epilepsy. And as you probably know, epilepsy is a storm in the brain. The neurons start to fire and they start to fire each other off. And as long as the neuron firing exists in only one hemisphere of the brain, as you know, the brain has two hemispheres, the right and left hemisphere. As long as it remains in one hemisphere, the person doesn't lose consciousness. But as soon as it crosses what's called the corpus callosum, which is one of the three bodies that join together the right and left hemispheres of the brain, and the, and the, the storm enters the other hemisphere, speak, but it can, by moving the left hand, it can work a keyboard or it can pick things up and, and, and point at things. And when people have split brains, this is what tends to happen. They tend to have something that's called alien hand syndrome, whereby one hand will do different things to the other hand. And they were talking with PS and they were saying to him, what would he like to be when he grew up? He was a teenager. And he turned around and said he would love to be um, um, uh, uh, a draftsman, quantity surveyor, that kind of thing. And as he did this, his left hand picked up a group of Scrabble uh, cards that were on the table and he wrote out automobile racer and this surprised the researchers because it made them realize that what was happening here is that there were two very different personalities inside this guy's head one of which wanted adventure and wildness and the other one that wanted safety and stability and as i think it was gaza nigger wrote and he turned around and said this is a surprising result because it means that there's part of us that's being overruled all the time now Again, Terry may be interested in this, in that this was an incident that happened to me in Liverpool in Speak many years ago, when, because of my writings, people come interesting store there. It has a mezzanine floor, it did have at the back, which you could overlook the front of the store. And she had explained to me beforehand that she'd gone into the centre of Liverpool on a bus, then she'd left her son and his friend in the city centre and come out six miles on the bus to speak to meet me. And she said, I'm going to go back later to pick up my son in the city centre and we're going to go back home. So we're talking, she sits down and we buy her a cup of coffee. And then as she buys her cup of coffee, she suddenly goes into um, what is technically known as an absent state. It's a petty, petty mal absent state, which is one of the, the symptoms of temporal lobe epilepsy. And she just stirred at me. And I knew she'd gone into a petty mal state, so I just waited for her to come back. And as she's staring at me, she suddenly says, what's he doing here? He shouldn't be here. That's impossible. He should be in the town center. And then she comes to, and I'm about to say to her what she just said to me, when she looked over the mezzanine floor and the doors opened and her son and his friend walked in through the doors. And she turned around to me and she said, what's he doing here? He shouldn't be here. He should be in the city centre. She repeated exactly what her alternate personality had stated two minutes before. Now, to me, that was classic example of pre uh, precognition. So clearly, whatever this entity is that is in the non-dominant hemisphere, it seems to be able to view the immediate future of its environment. So clearly, this is greater than us. But your question, John, is, is it the daemon? I'm not too sure. I think that probably the daemon probably communicates with the Edelon within the brain, probably through the non-dominant hemisphere. I think that's where the communication channels exist with the daemon. Now, just very quickly, the daemon is your game player. Imagine you're existing in a, uh, a three-dimensional VR version of your life. You're living your life again in a VR version, and you've lived it many times. The daemon is your game player. The daemon is the person that has lived your life many times before. And it knows what's going to happen next because it's lived your life before. Just like somebody playing in a computer game knows up until the point where the last game was played, they know what the events were. And I think this is where the daemon guides you and works your way through life. Now, in my latest book, I'll be broadening out the daemon concept to say that there is, in fact, different levels of conscious awareness. And we have the Edelon, which is the person living within the simulation. We don't know our future. We only know our past. We're like the sprite on the screen. But then we have the daemon, which has lived your life before. And until the last point you got in the game, 
it will be able to guide you. This is the voice in the head. This is the thing that warns you. This is, I think, what John is talking about that manifests in his life. And it's the thing that manifests in the life of people like Myron Dial. This is what Charon is. But I'm coming to the conclusion that because I don't think consciousness is based in the brain, I think the brain is a receiver of consciousness. I think that above the daemon is something I call now the uber daemon. And the uber daemon is the equivalent of Jung's collective unconscious. This is the awareness of all of humanity. And then I'm then arguing that then above that, there's something I call the go daemon. And the go daemon is effectively what we call God. It is the consciousness of the universe. It is, it is everything that is. It is, the, it is like Brahman. It's like the orain self within the Kabbalah. This is the, the, the ultimate intelligence that creates the information which has us existing within the information field. So very quickly, it is the, the, the split brain operations are evidence of this, but it's evidence only that probably the communication channels are more directly obvious uh, with somebody who's had who, who has a unified brain but split brain operations it means if you can tune into the non-dominant hemisphere you can get more information and of course this it can be evidenced in so many different ways we know I know from thousands of people that have contacted me over the years with regards to communications to their own daemon this makes eminent sense um, and I thank very much John for, for an excellent question so then Is I'd that, like to move sorry. on <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, I thought there was a good pause there at that point. I know there's always a delay in these things. John, does that actually cover the topic area that you were inquiring about quite happily? Yes. No, no, that's that's quite brilliant. And and I've had so many personal experiences that maybe I'll contact you for where uh, I believe my daemon has, has actually withheld information from me for periods of time with the awareness that releasing it to me at another time would allow me to perceive it better and some other very odd uh, information uh, dumps that are very difficult to explain. And this, may, this is actually, this was one of my hypotheses as well, was it essentially that the non-dominant was the, was the pass-through uh, or the receiver of that information. So th this actually solves a, a quandary I've been going over my head for many months. And so I, I truly appreciate it. Uh, that's interesting, John, because one of the things I wanted to finish off though, with uh, was as well, of course, we have um, disassociative personality syndrome or what was commonly known as, as uh, split as um, split personalities. Effectively, I think this is, again, because we're not one personality throughout our lives. You know, effectively, we we have different personalities. And I can say that as a qualified psychometrician, because one of the things I do in my business world is I, I, I do psychometric testing uh, for people, for businesses. And one of the things I've always wanted to do is to have a circumstance whereby you had somebody who'd done the WADA test and have them do a 16 PF or a personality profile and then have them do the profile as a normal person. And then we could be in the situation where we could compare your non-dominant personality with your, your everyday personality. And then we could probably use that as a dynamic way of, of therapy, you know, helping people in terms of therapy to understand that, they're not just one personality and we can access two. Uh, and I think that would be really, really good. OK, so, so moving on, still on. Can the, I just pause uh, you again for one second? I'm sorry for interrupting. The thing is that we've yeah. had some technical difficulties. We lost about 20 seconds of the audio we're recording, which is now back on recording fine, which is good. And also one person who's come late, which is Oni, and he is very valuable to our community. He's been to multiple talks and I think once I quickly introduce him to you, and he will actually talk about his knowledge of schizophrenia quickly and briefly introduce himself, that will be nicely added into the one that you will be answering the question on Greybeard's question, if that's okay with you. Of course it is. Of course it is. Oni, if you would like to obviously step up, mention your Twitter handle. Obviously, if you want your forename, you can do. And also where in the world you are and what social media platforms you have seen Anthony Peake's work on or what books you've read. This will give us an understanding of where people are coming from. And around the world, it will help us all out. We will be mentioning these kind of things throughout when more people join in. But as you're here now, I just thought I'd give you the option to know what was going on and it is being recorded. Oni, please take the floor. Uh, good day, everyone uh, in the space, and uh, good day, Anthony. How are you? I'm very well, Oni. Wonderful to have you on board. I'm great. Uh, yeah, 
my I'm from South Africa and uh, I'm a businessman combined with uh, I'm a creative ideologies I'm an author I have multiple skills in me and uh, that is uh, uh, gone by when I was the uh, uh, learning about myself in the past and I end up being who I am now. Uh, I had a very rough uh, back background whereby like my my mother uh, uh, happened to have schizophrenia. We kind of like uh, raised ourselves in a way. Uh, like I have, uh, we we having like a Sometimes she was normal. Sometimes she was like, I don't know how to mention it. And uh, we adjusted to that lifestyle until we, we grew up. Yet we never uh, come like uh, differently, but we came okay. Uh, uh, both me and my siblings, we are all uh, business people. And we are normal uh, like everyone else. Although, like, we never had, like, a, a normal up, upbringing. Like, it was rough. When I, when I tend to think about it, it was rough. So, the concept of schizophrenia, uh, I realized that the, it was, like, a, something uh, differently because of uh, from what I've, I've been with my mom, like, you always, like... Uh, speak like he was speaking with some people and whereas we don't see them every time like he will say like uh, you know these people are saying we should move to america we should move to usa and uh, and the funny thing about it is like i won't say like it's the funny thing the strange thing about it was it was combined with her gift like a prophetic gift as well like he will able to see things that's going to happen and they happen, and but the time when he sees he sees them and tell you like this and this, and you feel like maybe he's kind of like uh, crazy or something is not right. Yet after some few years, those things happen exactly like that, and I'm still I was still like uh, having like those answers until like I joined this group, like you know. And it's still like uh, something that I don't know, like uh, how to, how can I explain it to somebody? Uh, what is it? Although like uh, uh, she was diagnosed with schizophrenia, but uh, every time you would say like uh, there are people who are speaking and we can't hear them, we can't see them, but uh, she sees them. So there are many strange cases that are happening. And even now, uh, she kind of see people. I don't know. Was how can I explain it clearly? So I don't know. It's happening mentally, spiritually, or what's really happening. That's what I think. Um, can I? Can I? Can I come in? Uh, one of the things. Uh, can I answer your question first, and then we'll go back because it actually links in with um, something that uh, Greybeard was wanting to ask as well. Um, in my book, The Daemon, A Guide to Your Extraordinary Secret Self, um, I discuss the daemon and the daemon's role within, the, the, within consciousness. But more importantly, only I think you need to check out my book. Um, my book's The Infinite Mindfield uh, and also The Hidden Universe. Um, um, because in um, the, I think it's the Infinite Mind, I can't remember which book it is now, but I introduce the concept I call the um the huxleyan spectrum and in the huxleyan spectrum what i argue is that we are we we, we the, the the channels of communication between the daemon and what i would call the greater universe the metaverse depends upon the chemical configurations of our brain so for example the vast majority of human beings well i wouldn't say the vast majority i'd say probably the majority are what's called neurotypicals in that they their brains are, are, are virtually shut down. Now, many, many years ago, a guy called Henri Bergson, who was a French philosopher, followed up by an English philo uh, philosopher called C.D. Broad, and then all, and through to Aldous Huxley, all argued that the brain acts as an attenuator, 
the brain is there to take out information. It's not there to bring in information. It, 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 it takes out information in order for us to be able to function in, for want of a better term, this simulation that we're living in. But certain individuals, when their brains are configured in slightly different ways, become aware of the greater universe that's out there. And their brains are tuned into that. And I would argue that the first step is people like myself who, who um, experience what's called classic my, classical migraine, where we have aura states. And we, we, before we have a migraine attack, we, we go into this kind of altered state of consciousness. The next step on is then temporal lobe epilepsy. And people experience this. And again, you know, going on about uh, Toby's comment about um, Myron Dial and TLE. This is then the next step along the line. This is where the doors of perception, as, as, Aldous, Hux, as uh, Aldous Huxley wrote about and William Blake wrote about in his poem, are slightly more open. So the information field, it's as if you're a radio tuned in, but the frequency you're tuning into is wider. But ordinary people don't fit it, don't pick up these, these because they're, they're shut down. Their frequency is locked into one particular channel. So TLEers experience a much more wide experience of life. The colors are brighter. The, the world is, is different. But then when the doors are flung open, it's schizophrenia. And what happens there is that the signals that are coming in, it's as if suddenly you're hearing all the radio stations at the same time. And quite rightly, it drives you crazy because you're hearing voices that are coming in from different voice areas. Is it the voice of your own subconscious? Is it the voice of dead people? What is happening here? And it literally drives, because people don't know what to do, but what is happening is they become precognitive. Now, again, temporal lobe epilepsy in years gone by was known as the diviner's disease because temporal lobe epileptics were known to be able to perceive the future. But schizophrenics are even more so. Now, there's a friend of mine whose son is, experiences schizophrenia. And we are convinced that he, he exists in all the times of his life. One minute he's a child, the next minute he's an old man, then he's himself, then sometimes he can pick up the thoughts of other people. And of course, he confuses them with his own thoughts. So it's terrifying. And I would, I, I would draw a parallel here. And in my latest, one of my latest books, I discuss this as well, that you can draw into here autism because the doors of perception are also open with autistic people. And autistic people is a term called the wild world syndrome, because, you know, you go into shops and they have autistic for autistic children. They need quietness and they need quietness for a very good reason. Their perception field is much, much wider. Now, again, and uh, our friend uh, RN can say about this as well in terms of DMT. DMT seems to open up the doors of perception as well, and people perceive far more. So your, your examples are just so true to, to me. I, I, I've been contacted by people who experience schizophrenia a great deal of time over the years, and they, they back up what I say. They say, you know, it, people need to understand. And again, I'll give the classic final example of this. There's a, um, a very famous example from Greek philosophy called Plato's Cave. And in Plato's Cave, Plato imagined the argument that all of us, for all of our lives, are like prisoners in a cave. And we are tied in a cave and we can't move our heads and we're looking at the back wall of a cave. Behind us is a, a, um, a fire and we see the shadows on the wall as the, between the fire and ourselves, there's a walkway and people walk along with cardboard cutouts of animals and trees and everything else. And the people, the prisoners see on the cave, the shadows on the cave, and they believe that's what's reality. I believe what takes place when somebody gets schizophrenia and some of the other elements, it's as if their shackles have been loosened, they've got up and they can walk past to the entrance to the cave and they see the world as it really is. And then they go back to their friends and say, hey, guys, the world you think it is, it isn't. It's much bigger. It's much wider. It's much more exciting. And of course, the other prisoners think they're mad. They think they're insane. And this is what happens. The prisoner who escapes is the one that is condemned to being mad. And of course, it drives them even crazier then because the world is rejecting them. And I'd make one final point here. And I think another area which I deal with in my next, in my last book as well, which is profoundly important, is also Alzheimer's. And I think Alzheimer's also opens the doors of perception. Uh, we can talk about this later, but only that is that was excellent. 
Right, I'm going to go back now to, to Grey Can I just question. pause you again? Because we've got some good yep. people that have come in who have got the kind of brains and the experiences which I know that are your area. And again, he's a regular person to our community, is Gabe. I don't know if he's got the capability of talking at the moment. Gabe, if you give me the fist symbol, if you can't talk at this present time from the icon list. Maybe Gabe is fighting to try and get hold of... Oh, right, so he can't talk at the moment. That's fine. Oh, okay. um, there was a qu quick one where Renegade had his hand up. If it's very quick, and then we can get into there. And also, I think Terry had a small question which might add it into the information that Anthony was just talking about. Because we're a small group at the moment, we can do this. But obviously, we're keeping it brief to push the information to Anthony as he's got limited time with us at this present time. A renegade? Well, uh, I have a question for Anthony, uh, because at my uh, work, um, there's many uh, low frequency. Um, and if I focus on this low frequency, I literally, I literally go crazy. And sometimes I even experience an out-of-body experience. And I've been with the story to the doctor, to a psychiatrist, a psychology, and they say, ah, maybe you're hypersensitive, but they don't believe it's possible to get an out-of-body experience caused by low frequency. Extraordinary. But Extraordinary. Maybe you have, uh, but maybe you have some experience with low frequency. Yeah, types. very, very much so. This is of profound importance here. Um, I wrote a book called The Out-of-Body Experience around about 12 years ago, and that opened up communication with myself and a large number of individuals who experience out-of-the-body experiences, lucid dreaming, um, and of course the big debate as to whether out-of-body experiences and lucid dreaming are similar aspects of the same phenomenon or not. And the vast majority of these individuals tell me that prior to... Um, the out-of-body state, they go into what's called a vibrational state. And the vibrational state is literally they feel their body vibrating in some way. Now, clearly there is a link here, and I don't know who on earth is telling you that there is no link between um, low vibrations and out-of-the-body states. They're absolute idiots. They should do their research. For instance, a guy called Michael Persinger at the Laurentian University in Sudbury in Ontario in Canada uh, the late Michael Michael Persinger, I may add, did a series of experiments in the 1980s and 1990s with something he called the God Helmet. And the God Helmet was effectively a converted motorcycle crash helmet that would place low-frequency sounds um, and, 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 and other vibrations onto the temporal lobes of the person wearing the helmet. And when the individuals did this, and this is very intriguing, most of the cases, they created what was called the sensed presence. And the sensed presence was a feeling that there was somebody else in the room with them or there was somebody near them. Now, I'd argue that what is taking place here is Persinger's helmet is actually, again, facilitating communications on the wider spectrum of perception. And the person is starting to perceive either, and this is an interesting point, either they're perceiving the other person within the non-dominant hemisphere, which is logical, isn't it? You know, that if they're in that state, they would feel this other person, which is them but is not, or whether they're feeling and perceiving the, um, the daemon. Uh, that I'm not sure, to be honest. But it is intriguing them because they have this vibration state. And that's when, with other individuals, the out-of-body experience starts to take place. Now, it could be, for argument's sake, we could say, couldn't we, that, and this is an argument that has been used a lot. There was um, a series of experiments done, again, I think, funnily enough, in the Netherlands, um, or was it Denmark? Um, I can't remember now, but the, there was a series of experiments done where they, they, they reproduced the out-of-body experience by using virtual reality and having somebody with a headset on looking at the back of their own head. In other words, there was a camera behind them and within the virtual reality headset, they could see the back of their own head. And that brought about, together with vibrational state, it brought about a feeling of not being in your own body or moving out of your own body. And they argued 
well, we've now proven that the out-of-body experience is, is literally neurologically based. Well, yeah, great, guys. You proved it's neurologically based. You have not proved anything about the experience. Just because you prove that by stimulating parts of the brain, you can reproduce something. But what are you reproducing? You know, when people report veridical experiences whereby in near-death experiences or, or out-of-body experiences, where they come back with information they couldn't possibly know, that to me suggests that this is far more intriguing. And I know of people who have been in out-of-body experiences and have brought back information. But get this, I know of individuals that not only had out-of-the-body experiences where they have gone out of their body, they've gone out of their body and they've witnessed scenes from the future. Categorical. I'll give an example of this, for instance. A friend of mine, Graham Nichols, and look at Graham Nichols' work. It's quite fascinating. He's a writer on out-of-body experiences. He was doing um, a lecture on out-of-body, uh, a lecture, uh, 1999. And as he was giving his lecture, he felt his knees buckle. And he felt himself losing consciousness. The next thing he finds himself, he's in, a, he's in an out-of-body state, he's in a jungle. And he's walking through the jungle and he's feeling the heat on his body and there's gra long grass around him. Then he presses the, the jungle away from himself, goes through the grass, steps out, and he was in central London, in Soho. And he was standing on the corner of Wardour Street and Old Compton Street. And he's standing there thinking, this is London. I'm in London. But he could hear the voices of the people in the lecture theatre calling to him, saying, you all right? All right, Graham. He looks round, a young lad runs past him, and he felt the displacement of his kids there as he walked past. He looks down the street to see an explosion halfway down the road in Soho. People come storming out of this pub covered in blood, screaming in agony. The alarms go off and everything. He then finds himself raising up, and he wakes up. The first thing he said to six people, six people witnessed this, and he said, there's going to be a terrorist attack in Soho soon. And he described exactly the location. Six days later, there was the bomb of the Admiral Duncan pub in Soho, where I think about six or seven people were killed. There was a nail bomb. He saw that in the future and it was witnessed. The only possible explanation for that, for me, is the only one. They're all lying because that's the only way that a present scientist who is in denial of these altered states of consciousness can justify. And of course, they just they categorize and say, oh, they're all lying because they can't say that was an hallucination because it came to pass. So this is how important these altered states of consciousness are. So that was excellent. Thank you very much for that question. Okay, I think... T Thank you to Anthony uh, for answering uh, this uh, question for me. Thank you. Apologies about that, Renegade. I just over -talked you. It's one of those things with this screen when you're trying to find things out. I know Terry had his hand up. I don't know if... <laughs> yeah, you can laugh at me at a minute, Renegade. We have these technical difficulties sort of along these lines. Terry, you had your hand up. Did you need to add into the actual section that Renegade was talking about and Anthony? And also welcome to Naomi and also to Bitcoin Bum, who are also regulars of our community. If you want to, at a later stage, want to talk, please raise your hand and then introduce yourself and your question or just anything along those lines. To help our research and understanding, leave Perceptions Today's podcast reviews, subscribe to the podcast, along with the other social media accounts and share. Come and join our live events. That way we can get together and have thoughtful discussions along with advancing our understanding of concepts as we go along.